The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man And until you've thoroughly tested every last close just True, Dr. Zayas. Well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carl Wood and Company. Alright, higher side chatters, after all the suppressed technology, secret science, and alchemical effects we've talked about it becomes obvious that there are pockets of the power pyramid that have kept enough of these things to themselves through the years to justify the terms we use, like breakaway civilization and secret space program. Well, with us again, almost a year to the date, is a great researcher in this vein, Walter Bosley. The product of a military family himself, he's worked serving as a counterintelligence agent for the FBI, a special agent for the Air Force, and a consultant in the private sector, He's also used his training, military insight, and investigative skills to dig deeper into several pieces of the big conspiracy pie, but most notably this very notion of a breakaway civilization. In our last show, Walter broke down how a group of hermetic Prussian nationalists known as the Nimza likely developed advanced technology based on their rediscovery of something ancient, and that an aligned group called the Sonora Aero Club way back in the mid-19th century seems to have created exotic flying machines in the California desert that could have been responsible for the vast aeroship sightings 40 years later, and might have even resulted in a Tesla-developed craft capable of making it to Mars in 1903. It's a lot to unpack, but in the years since that interview, new developments have come to light that very well may tie this underground network to the family of the president himself, and that's what I call the sweet spot, ladies and gentlemen. Back in the saddle for another wild ride, the author of several great books, the deep state decoder himself, the man who knows the plan, Walter Bosley. Welcome back to the higher side. Hey, Greg, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Thanks for doing it. Your work is just really stuck with me. And when it comes to tracking back the progression of secret flying machines, exotic fuel sources, and this connection to German nationalists, you have made really huge contributions. And rather than talking about the same old bullet points surrounding the Nazi bell or the reverse engineering of the Roswell craft, you have fleshed out this story and filled in a lot of the holes there. And it just seems to go much deeper. And I guess in the interest of leaving no man behind, can we give the people just a little more context about the NIMSA Sonora Aero Club Nexus and set up the story for the pieces we're going to add? Help maybe refresh their memories a bit if you could. What should we know about this group and that time period between 1850 and the early 1900s? Well, fortunately, the book I'm currently working on is going to go into greater detail than I've ever had before regarding this organization, NIMSA. So there's that to look forward to (laughs) in about another month or so. So this conversation is timed really well. It's going to kind of whet the appetite of the listeners. But essentially, when we're talking about the 19th century period leading into the 20th, we're talking about specifically the Prussian nationalists who, it is believed, called themselves NIMSA, and we're pursuing a development of a technology that it appears they believed would give them greater leverage in pushing towards a unified Germany, which of course eventually happened, mm-hmm. and then went much farther in the early 20th century rise of the Nazi party. And essentially, this 19th century NIMSA according to the original source we have on it, Charles Delschau, was a German-headquartered organization that had apparently several little groups under its wing, under its aegis, and they would finance and provide you know, various resources for these little groups to develop this particular technology. And the case in point that Delschau focused on was the little group of German immigrants to the United States that called themselves the Sonora Aero Club, and they operated out of Tuolumne County, just west of Yosemite National Park. And these guys in the 1850s were allegedly building what I would call proof-of-concept flying machines, okay? I want you to think of the automobile 
okay, the history of the automobile, and I want you to go back to the Ford Model T. Mm -hmm. That was just a basic car, right? Four wheels, motor, and a place to fit, and a steering wheel. Basic car, proof of concept. I mean, particularly when you compare that to cars 30, 40 years later in them today. That's what these Sonora Aero Club flying contraptions were. Proof of concept. Now, where NIMSA came in was that they were the group that had some type of oversight involvement, which the leaders, the guys in the Sonora Aero Club, ultimately rejected. Okay, They ultimately did not want to go the way that NIMSA wanted them to go. Consider NIMSA to be the first true military industrial complex hmm. you know, in modern times. Because that's really what they were putting together. In my books, I theorize, and in fact, I lay out several of the suspects that were top industrialists, you know, and financial leaders, and guys who were very much into alchemy and the occult sciences and such. These are the guys that I lay out as suspects who would have been the members of this Prussian group, NIMSA. Okay. Mm. And they were really putting together literally this military industrial complex they were using their resources to develop this technology and what they wanted to do was have these guys of the sonora aero club and probably the others that we don't hear about from del shell other than i mentioned nimza wanted them to equip these flying machines for military application with weapons and such and the guys in the sonora aero club didn't want to they rejected that that's a whole interesting other story the leader of the sonora aero club peter menace ended up allegedly dying in an explosion and crash of one of these things. Hmm. Possible that it could have been murder. It's possible that he might have faked his death to, you know, escape the Nimza. But this was in the 1850s now, the decade before the American Civil War. So when the 1890, specifically 1896-1897 airship mystery emerges, I personally think that that was a product of an American group that had been developing this airship technology, but we have other sources that have NIMSA emerging in the New York esoteric occult milieu of the 1890s. We're talking John W. Keeley, and we're talking Clara Bloomfield Moore and Helena Blavatsky and that group, and that included the German mystics at the time. Hmm. And here we have NIMSA allegedly still existing and being involved with things to do with this flying machine technology. And, of course, that milieu is a link into the 20th century, early 20th century German mystics who were involved with the guys who founded the Nazi Party. And, of course, the rest is history. So, as you can see in all of that, NIMSA is this shadowy organization that was really operating like a breakaway because they obviously had their own resources and wealth enough to be independent. Now, when I say nationalist, Prussian nationalist, they weren't an official, you know, there was no Prussian single government because it was before Germany was unified. But even after they unified, they weren't particularly, you know, a German government agency. They weren't part of the German military. They were still their own thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about here. That's the context. It was very Prussian in its membership. It was Prussian in its goals and objectives. And its main objective was a unified Germany that dominated globally. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you see their roots into the formation of the Nazi party, it becomes obvious what they were about. However, all that said, that context of 19th century and early 20th century, all that said, I still say, and I go into this in my book, and I'm especially going into this into the new one, there was a NIMSA that was a bigger, larger organization in the background of that. In other words, the Prussian NIMSA that Charles Delshaw talks about, that we've just been talking about, that was a subordinate group within a larger, more secretive group. Mm. And I've already gone into that in stuff I've already done, but like I said, new details and much more <laughs> coming forth. So. Well, that is some great context for sure, and I definitely plan to have a few questions for you about that 
higher capstone group. And this is a hell of a structure with, like you said, tons of subgroups. But I also wanted to ask you a little bit more about the 1903 group. I guess that's the term that you give them. Yes. I guess they came out of dissolving the Sonora Aero Club and then turned into this other group. Tell us a little bit about them and uh, kind of how that ties into the Tesla story. Well, and again, this is how I have pieced this together. Okay. If you go to an excellent book by a gentleman named Michael Busby titled Solving the 1896 or 1897. I'd have to look at the book. It's not sitting in front of me. Solving the 1896 Airship Mystery. Busby provides some excellent data involved in all this stuff that was going on around people seeing these airships in the skies over several cities west of the Mississippi in the United States. I mean, they were all over the place, from the Midwest down to Texas, out in Utah, California. I mean, it was amazing. Now, remember, we're talking the 1890s. People in the 1890s knew the difference between a hot air balloon, a dirigible, and these airships they were describing, okay? They knew the difference. And when you really get into the reports and read the descriptions, you'll see that there's clearly a difference in the details of these things and how they operate and how they function. What's interesting is Busby points out an actual guy, there's a photo of him in the book, a man named Solomon Andrews, who went to Abraham Lincoln's administration, I believe he wrote Lincoln directly, and said he had developed a flying machine that would be good for reconnaissance and such. And, and I think this was 1863. And Lincoln was intrigued and instructed his war secretary, Edwin Stanton, to take a look at Solomon Andrews' flying contraption. Well, according to the news reports of the day, Solomon Andrews demonstrated this flying machine, which he called the Aeron, the A-E-R-O-N, the Aeron. He demonstrated it for several officers from the War Department and journalists, Washington, D.C. journalists of the day. They talk about it flying and its maneuverability and such. Now, history tells us that Edwin Stanton told Andrews, thanks, but no thanks. We're in the middle of this war. You know, I don't see where there's an application here. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. And we're told the story ends right there, where Solomon Andrews and his flying machine are concerned. Well, I disagree with that. Because 30 years later, you have the airship mystery, okay? And there is a smoking gun, which connects it back, in my opinion, to the U.S. War Department. And this is why I think this was a result of the first American black project, and that is this. In the 1890s mystery, there is a report of a witness who encountered one of these airships on the ground, and had a lengthy conversation with the two men who were manning it, who were flying it. And those two men were Colonel Samuel Tillman, the U.S. Army, and Professor Amos Dolbear. Now, Amos Dolbear, you can look up both these guys, by the way. They're on the Internet. Look them up. They really live. There's photos of them, the whole resume of what they did. Dolbear, one of the things he did, one of his inventions, was a telephone prior to Alexander Graham Bell's version. In fact, I believe Dolbear had even sued Bell over the issue. Hmm. So Dolbear's a real guy in history. Tillman, U.S. Army officer, was a cartographer, a geographer. He was a chemist. He was an explorer. All the things that are, interestingly, that are involved in the airship mystery regarding propulsion and how these things fly, Samuel Tillman was an expert in. He ended up being commandant of West Point when World War I broke out. This is a real guy. Now, here's what's interesting. In this 1890s incident, it is Tillman and Dolbear who show this guy their airship, explain how it works basically, and offer to give him a flight and such. And I mean, these were human beings. These were real actual guys. Now, what's interesting is Tillman and Dolbear, it's not like they were famous celebrities. Okay, so why... If someone's going to make this up, they would pull those guys out of a hat, you know, is interesting. But 
when you look at the fact that it was Tillman involved in one of these reports, to me, that indicates a connection somehow to that U.S. War Department story and Solomon Andrews. Now, the scenario that I extrapolate out of this, and I admit it's speculation, but the scenario I extrapolate out of this is that Stanton did not reject Solomon Andrews' technology. It's that we were indeed in the middle of a war that had to be taken care of first. And what I suggest is once the war was over, the U.S. government said, hey, you know what? Let's do something with this. Now, why would it be a black project? Why would it be secret? Well, you know, various political intrigues. There were still countries in Europe and such that really would like to have seen us fail. There were British bankers that were pumping money to the Confederacy privately. You know, they wanted to see the U.S. fail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this was in those days where, well, if we've got this technology, this could be an edge. Let's keep it secret. Another angle could be that because the war had just ended, we were in the reconstruction period, how would it have looked if when the half the country needed to be rebuilt, they're spending money on this contraption, like something out of a Jules Verne story? So there are a few legitimate reasons why this would have been our first black project, why they would have kept it secret. And I say that between what Solomon Andrews demonstrated in 18... 63 or 4, and what people were reporting in the 1890s, I say you had 30 years of development. So Solomon Andrews' rudimentary Aeron had developed into the more complicated airships like what Tillman and Dolbear were reportedly flying around. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the world was changing. America was changing as we were leaving the 19th century and going into the 20th century. People could see the direction things were going, and certainly I think some of these guys who were involved with these airships in the 1890s, I don't think they liked where things were going. So we get into 1903, the year in question. Mm -hmm. There is a legend out there a rumored legend that Nikola Tesla had designed an airship that these guys built and possibly flew to Mars, and they flew away and they were never seen again. Now, as crazy as that sounds, we do have Tesla having had worked on his ideas of anti-gravity and flying machines and such. So there is a sliver a margin of possibility that Tesla would have been involved in an attempt to do this. Now, of course, by 1903, the 1890s airship mystery had been all over the newspapers, so one could argue that the whole Tesla airship to Mars thing was just a big fantasy inspired by that. Of course, that is possible. But we're talking about, you know, being within a context here that these things possibly happen, and we have the evidence like Samuel Tillman being one of the identified pilots of these things. So we go into the 20th century, and let's continue on the limb of speculation and say that this theory is right, that there was this you know group that had developed these things. The next logical thing for them to attempt, I could see, would be flying one of these things off the planet. Mm -hmm. The most obvious target would have been the moon, but why not Mars? Mars had been looked at for years and all this interesting stuff imagined and proposed about it. So why not Mars? Well, supposing that they attempted this and it worked, okay, and let's say they survived. What's interesting is a decade later or so, Tesla writes an article in which he talks about receiving what he believes were intelligent signals from space, from Mars. A researcher, a guy named Jonathan Batista, brought it to my attention one day, and he suggested, what if these signals that Tesla was talking about in that article were actually communications from this group that attempted their flight to Mars? What if they survived? What if it worked? Therein lies the little speck of possibility that I 
propose this breakaway that I call the 1903. Obviously, I call them the 1903 because that's the year associated with this crazy story of guys flying a Tesla airship to Mars. <laughs> you know, if it worked, my theory is they saw what they had. Who knows what they found on Mars? Consider what we think we're finding on Mars now. Now, just have fun with this. Just have fun with this. Let's say 104 years ago, these guys really got there and they found the same remnants of the civilization that we think we're finding today. Okay. What would, you know, what would they have done? Well, I say that that was the decision point for them, the turning point. I say that's when they would have looked at what they had, what they found, and that's when they decided to break away and make this technology their own. Because remember, these are the guys who had developed it. These were the guys that, you know, they felt kind of an ownership of it because they were the ones who had, had carried it this far. They were the ones doing these things. And that is kind of the, the basic background of how I came to this theory that there is this breakaway that I call the 1903. I, now, if they exist, I don't know what they call themselves. Right. I refer to them as the 1903. And philosophically, in my opinion, they would have been quite opposed to the NIMSA, okay? Very much opposed to the NIMSA. Right on. So that's a great story that I love and quite a few building blocks. Now, how do we connect the dots from from here to the current president or his family? Oh, that is a story that made my jaw drop. Me too. <laughs> and I have Stephen Romano to thank for pointing it out to me. Stephen Romano runs a gallery in New York, and he and some other writers put together this book about Charles Delshaw, which is primarily a large book, full color plates of Charles Delshaw's art, his drawings of these flying contraptions from the 1850s. It's an astonishing book. I recommend it highly to anyone really interested in this stuff. And one day, a couple of years back, maybe a year or so ago, I'd have to look, Stephen asked me if I had noticed this particular little batch of drawings. Delshaw did hundreds of these, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have not laid eyes on all of them still myself. But Stephen pointed out a drawing which dates back sometime between 1890 and 1910 that Delshaw did of one of these flying machines from the 1850s, which was designed and allegedly constructed by one of the original members of the Sonora Aero Club. Okay, and that man's name in the 1850s was Trump, <laughs> T-R-U-M-P. And there in his drawings, dating back sometime between 1890 and 1910, is the arrow, and it has the name Trump right there in the artwork. I've published an article on this, of course, and I'll be including, you know, the discussion of this in the new book. But it's on my empiretheweel.blogspot.com. If you scroll down, you'll find it. You can't miss it. Now, so there was that, and that made my jaw drop. I mean, could it be? We know that Donald Trump's family, ancestors from Germany, immigrated here in the 19th century. Was it possible that there's a connection between his family and this Trump guy in the 1850s Sonora Aero Club? Well, you know, if we just had that, it would be this interesting little quirky thing. <laughs> But there's the rest of the story, <laughs> right? and that's where the 1903 comes in. Now, to give the quick background, I argue that how Solomon Andrews in the 1860s came to know about this anti-gravity stuff is that it's very possible he was associated somehow with members of the Sonora Aero Club or one of the other groups that we don't know about that just Del Shell just alluded to. And so you might have had some of the Sonora Aero Club guys involved in this black project, this post-Civil War black project. Now, remember, Solomon Andrews called his flying machine the Aeron, A-E-R-O-N, and Delshaw, you know, he referred to the ones the decade prior as Aeros, A-E-R-O. Now, I know that that's a prefix having to do with things aeronautical, aeroplane, you know, and so forth. Right. But it's interesting that there's this similarity in what they call their contraptions, okay? Now, what I'm saying is, if the pedigree 
of this black project includes guys from the Sonora Aero Club of the 1850s into this black project that stood up post-Civil War in 1865 and was involved in the 1890s airship mystery. We know that Donald Trump's known ancestor was in the United States by the 1880s if he is also a descendant of the Trump and the Sonora Aero Club, it's very possible that that Sonora Aero Club Trump, you know, had some contact with or something to do with Donald Trump's ancestor that was here in the 1880s, and that there might have been a Trump involved in this 1890s airship mystery milieu. Okay? Now, that's not even the interesting part. Hmm. We get to this 1903 story where Tesla, as I said before, allegedly, you know, an airship of his design flies to Mars and on and on and so forth. We, you know, subsequently know that Tesla got involved with secret U.S. technology as we got into World War II, into that era. We come to 1943 when Nikola Tesla dies. Okay, he lived in a room in a hotel in New York City. And the day he died, federal agents showed up at his room and removed documents from his personal safe. Okay? Now, speculation is that these documents involved classified technology that he had been doing for the Office of Naval Research. Okay? And the FBI wanted to take a look at the time at these papers, so they hired or enlisted an expert, a technical expert, to look at those documents. This is history. This is fact. There's no speculation here. The FBI hired this individual with the technical expertise to look at Tesla's papers that they were allowed to see by the Navy, okay? And I believe the Immigration Service at the time. The guy that they hired to look through Tesla's papers was John Trump. Donald Trump's uncle, who he has spoken of on several occasions. John Trump was, I believe, an electrical engineer. He was an engineer and associated with MIT. You can look him up. Real guy. The president talks about him all the time. He was the guy who would understand Tesla's papers. Now, we're told that John Trump reported to the FBI, there's nothing here that would be of grave importance for the war effort right now, you know, but there are some interesting ideas. <laughs> so that was a bombshell, really. That and the fact that there was a Trump in the Sonora Aero Club. So what do I extrapolate from this? And it's it's a speculation. I laid out for you how, you know, Donald Trump's ancestors could have been involved in this whole airship mystery technology development of the 19th century. If there were Trumps involved with this group I call the 1903, if there were Trumps that knew about what these guys had done in going to Mars, okay, and, uh, you know, breaking away, so establishing their own little secretive group, it would be serving their interests if they had their family member, their guy, John Trump, taking a look at Tesla's papers to see if there's any mention of this alleged flight to Mars, or this 1903 group, right? Mm -hmm. And if John Trump was involved in this or played along, you know, he might have played it down. He might have removed the part about any mention of the 1903 or made sure that that remained secret, classified, whatever. This is all a speculation. But we have the uncle of the current president of the United States as you know, he is the guy the FBI hired to look at Tesla's papers. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got Tesla with his alleged connections to the airship mystery. You see the math, and interesting math starts to add up. Now, people will obviously say, did this have anything to do with Donald Trump becoming president? My comments on that are this. Isn't it interesting that this guy that set aside personal opinions or whatever, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting into a political discussion, isn't it interesting that this particular guy who rubs so many people the wrong way and so forth and on, he takes on the two most powerful political families of the last 30 years, right? And they come across like flaccid, limp rags. 
nothing they try works. Their hat is handed to them, and they're told, thank you, bye-bye. Right. And then, you know, Hillary hangs in there, and look what a fool she's made to look like. you got to ask yourself, wow, who was powerful enough to render the Bush dynasty and the Clinton machine as impotent as they clearly became? I mean, look how soon Jeb was shot down. Oh my gosh, the tactics. <laughs> right, right. So you got to ask yourself, what's interesting is every person who runs for president has a little mafia, we'll say, a little M. I don't mean the Italian mafia or the, you know, whatever. A little M. You know, they've got a powerful group, you know, power group behind them. And you got to ask yourself, okay, who was behind Trump? Was it the Russians? No, that's friggin' ridiculous, okay? I suggest based on all the stuff we're talking about, this Trump and the Sonora Aero Club, his, you know, Uncle John being the guy who got to see these famously mysterious Tesla papers. Think about that. You've got this airship mystery history milieu. You've got Trump's involved in that. Hmm, maybe I'm right. Maybe there is this group that yeah, I call the 1903. And it makes a lot of sense that NIMSA would back up the Clinton machine, that NIMSA would also at the same time back up the Bush dynasty. Because with those two groups, we're talking about globalists. We're talking about neocons. We're talking, you know, about modern fascist, socialist, you know, two sides of the same coin that want to do the same thing with their power in the world. They are clear NIMSA cutouts in my perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you would have NIMSA behind them. Well, who could stand up to NIMSA theoretically? With all this stuff I've said so far today, who could stand up to NIMSA? Possibly the Splinter Group. That's right. This other group, the 1903, That what did I say about them before? They would have, I firmly believe, they would have and do, if they exist, oppose NIMSA. And apparently they can match their power. Mm -hmm. Because I suggest that that's who the mafia behind Donald Trump's winning the presidency, that's who was behind him. That's who helped him confidently take on. I mean, because look at the Clinton dynasty or the Bush dynasty and the Clinton machine. You know, clearly they're both willing to do ruthless things. Right. OK. And they look like fools up against, you know, Trump's machine. That's true. The one other element I wanted to bring up to you, I don't know if you saw this, but John G. Trump gave an interview for a School of Radionics archival library. You can find it on YouTube. It's an old black and white interview where they got him at an old age. Have you seen this? No, I haven't. Oh, Please. it is amazing because there's so many key words in it. He talks about working for Weston when it became Bell Labs, when they changed their name to Bell Labs. He also mentions... Himself, in the first person, on camera, he mentions consulting Vannevar Bush personally on his thesis. And then Vannevar recommended that he connect with another scientist whose name I can't remember and hadn't heard before, but another scientist who was working on some wild theories that Vannevar said he checked out and they seem to have some merit. So he has this problem he can't solve in his thesis. He goes to Vannevar Bush... And Vannevar Bush recommends this guy who's working on wild theories. So that key term, wild theories, <laughs> sets off all kinds of alarm bells in my head. Sure. And it is so interesting to see that particular interview. And it ties it right into this nexus. But I guess my only confusion or contention would be that it seems like maybe we have a criminal or an underground network who just changed the horses they were going to back because Goldman Sachs is funding both sides in a large way. We have this interview where John G. Trump is working in the same building as Vannevar Bush. I wonder if for some reason they just said out with the old, we're going to go a different direction, but it's still the same mafia or at least elements of it. At the top, things are so interconnected. It's really hard to separate out two groups, but you know, you would know better than me. Unless, unless you come from the perspective I'm going to share to maybe, you know, illuminate this with an example. Now, for three years, when I was an OSI agent for 
my three years at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, I was chief of a counter espionage operations branch. What that is is double agent operations. Okay. Now, in the intelligence world, you have spooks of opposing factions, many times working side by side in a third party group all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, you know, number one, there is potentially a big explanation for what you just pointed out. So it can be confusing if you're outside this whole perspective. You know, well, how come these guys are working the same place? They must be in cahoots. And that might not have been the case. It might have been that you have Group A and Group B, okay? Let's say they want to infiltrate the FBI. Now, and when I say infiltrate, they just want their guys to kind of be in the whole mix there and maybe move up the management structure and right. eventually at some point have some influence over the FBI. Well, Group A recruits their young recruits, their young candidates, and you know they get them to apply and they get them to become agents and they help their career where they can. Now, during the course of the day, the duty day, these people... You know, and, and let's say Group B does the same thing, and Group A and B oppose each other, but they each have their own young folks becoming FBI agents, okay? Now, during the day, their duty day, these agents who each respectively represent Group A or Group B, they are FBI agents, and they go about their duties in an honest way. They're legitimately following the law, and they're doing what FBI agents do and such, right? But behind them is this group from which they've been you know, recruited to become an FBI agent. And wherever they hop around in their career, be it the FBI, be it the military, be it whatever, you know, NSA, CIA, or whatever, they are still Group A's boy or Group B's boy, Mm -hmm. okay? They're not being traitors. They're not telling secrets they shouldn't tell. They just have that association. Now, Group A and Group B oppose each other, they might each have their boys, their respective agents, on the same squad working bank robberies or working national security or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. On the same squad, you know, from opposing factions, but in the course of their duties they're doing for the FBI, their overt duties, they're doing it right. They're doing it legally. They're doing it right. Yet, they're still associated with different factions. To what degree they're each, you know, these agent representatives would be aware that they were really, you know, recruited by these groups, that differs. But what I'm saying is, yeah, I'm going to say that goes on a lot more than people would realize. (laughs) And that could explain why you have John G. Trump in the same place as Vannevar Bush and whoever else, you know. Yeah. The other issue, here's the contention I have with my own theory. If this 1903 broke away and had this technology, where the heck were they during the World Wars? True. We really could have used them during World War II, especially. And I, of course, argue that NIMSA being behind the Nazis, you know, NIMSA was the real big enemy, as well as the Nazis, in World War II. Where was this 1903? Well, in my opinion, the answer to that was they had just broken away in 1903. The Prussian NIMSA had 70 or 80 years on them, okay? Mm-hmm. When the 1903 breaks away, they still had to develop themselves and their technology and make their thing stronger. This is why I argue that they emerged, you know, around 2015 in our political process because they finally could. Mm-hmm. I argue that this is when they finally stood up and said, we're here. And we're here to play hard. And that kind of took the NIMSA by surprise. So that, too, could explain how you have a guy like John Trump, if he's affiliated with the 1903, working in the same places as these guys who we know are military, industrial, complex-associated, neocon, neo-Nazi-associated, NIMSA-associated, okay? Because 1903 was developing itself. And so think about it. You get your agents, your double agents, into Westinghouse or, excuse me, Bell Labs, or, you know, you get them into the military industrial complex to see what they're developing. Because, you know, it's my contention that our military industrial complex, obviously with its Operation Paperclip Nazi history and its foundation, right? 
I argue that that's an IMSA. Okay, anywhere you see post World War II Nazi military industrial complex, that's just throw NIMSA on there in the background. So naturally, if the 1903 is trying to build itself up to be able to match the NIMSA and, you know, come at them, well, they're going to put their guys as close to what NIMSA is doing in this military industrial complex, see, so that they can kind of do a little corporate espionage, so to speak, mm -hmm. and see what they're doing so that they can tailor their own development. So that's the best explanation I've come up with so far for the question, where were these guys during the World Wars when we could have used them? They just weren't able to take on NIMSA and the Nazis at that time. Wow, not bad, man. You make a really compelling case. And of course, counterintelligence is your expertise. So we have to strongly consider the way you break this down, the way you see it. And I wanted to throw on a couple added elements to the Delshaw drawing that reads Trump because it is so eerily similar to the way they stamp Trump right across Trump Tower. It's right in the very top, yep. similar type font. I mean, there's just a real synchronicity in the way it's displayed. And what is the deal with these Trumps? They just got to stamp their name on everything. That seems to be something that's part of uh, their DNA. And also, another synchronicity that is just too wild to believe almost, but this particular photo is in Del Shao's series 4500, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. And <laughs> Trump's the 45th president. <laughs> Ain't that interesting. Right. That's a whole conversation right there, Greg. That has to do with the number nine, and that's a whole conversation, and I am not surprised. You know, I was aware of that through the whole election that he Whoever would win would be the 45th president, and just with the nine thing alone. And the fact, when Stephen Romano pointed those plates out to me, and it's in the 4500 series, I, I laughed out loud, because I said, well, uh, of course. Now, to go back to the name, I want you to think about something. Think of the esoteric, magical implications of that name, okay? The name mm -hmm. is Trump, okay? I ask you, what did Donald Trump do? In the primaries, what did he do to Hillary Clinton? What did he do to all of them? He trumped them, just like in the card game. And we use the term trumping, and it's been used for years as kind of a euphemism for, I whoop your ass. Yeah. So think about it. You've got this guy, his name's Trump. So when you plaster that name on your stuff, you're bringing the power of that concept. Okay? And this is magic. This is a form of magic. It's psychological. Hell yeah. But it works. You're saying, boom, I'm trumping you. I trump you, right? And so when you mm -hmm. see my name in all caps and red letters or gold, boom, there it is. Basically, it's saying, whatever you can do, I will do better, and I'll whoop your ass proving it. And to me, there is why when you say, what's up with these guys? You know, I would venture to say if we each had a name like that, we might use it the same way. I mean, my first name, when I was a kid and learned what Walter means, strong ruler of army oh hell yeah i love that <laughs> i have fun with that all the time that's why i don't go by walt or wally i go by walter because it's that strong you know strong ruler of army so <laughs> it's the same thing and i think that's why donald does it you know on his yeah outfit. power in the name you know look uh, we live in an era where we demonize healthy ego even we demonize healthy aggression. You know, we want to take the teeth and the musculature off of the males in our society, okay? We want to neuter them, make them gentle. But nature says otherwise. Now, I don't advocate running around being a brute, okay, who, who bullies everybody and such, blah, blah, blah. But it's this whole, there is healthy ego. There is, you know, just healthy rah rah, you know, uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing that it has been very productive in a positive way. But we live in a time where we're supposed to deny that, be polite and deny that. Well, you know, my view is I'm almost 54 years old. I gave up on that polite crap years ago because I see yeah. it. Is. I will not be neutered. <laughs> Fair enough, man. That's a mind frame that, you know, there's other guys that learn it early on. You know, hey, mm -hmm. you're not going to neuter me and look what I can accomplish. And, you know, that's kind of my mindset. I also wanted to throw in a couple of elements of Internet speculation here with this 
Trump saga. Sure. But in several situations, we've seen fiction that mirrors real events and real covert projects. One well-known example would be the book about the mighty ship, the Titan, and its crash into the iceberg written 14 years before the Titanic saga. Yeah. Well, a parallel theme comes up in this saga, too, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Because in 1893, right in the heart of all this stuff, a woman living in New York named Ingersoll Lockwood wrote a book called Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey, where this boy goes down into the inner earth through a tunnel in Russia. The same author also wrote uh, several other books in this Baron Trump series, including one called The Last President, which describes severely polarized American crowds rioting and the riots start at a hotel on Fifth Avenue. Could that be Trump Tower? Now, to add icing on this cake, the book describes the riots starting on the date of November 3rd, which just so happens to fall on the next election day in 2020. So if the German last name of the 45th president appears in series 4500 of the secret German airship drawings, what the hell is going on with this book series? <laughs> Isn't that extremely delightful? I love this kind of stuff. <laughs> Look, there is most definitely something going on. What it is exactly, I couldn't tell you the whole thing. I will say the reason I am convinced of this is personally is due to things that I personally stumbled upon for myself years ago. And that has to do with why I wrote and how I found the threads to pull in the Empire, the wheel books that I've written, and really in everything I've written. But I don't have enough to, you know, go forward and say completely why I'm convinced there's something going on. But this kind of thing we're talking about, these Ingersoll Rand books, are just a tiny example of the kinds of things that are out there. Some people have suggested time travel, okay? Yes. You know, like there's some time travel machine and on and on and so forth. You know, I don't lean towards that. I do, for grins and chuckles, entertain the mm -hmm. possibility that you know, looking through time within a remote viewing context, you know, oh, maybe there's something like that going on. But indeed, at first when I heard this, I thought, oh, these books can't be real. This yeah. must be, no pun intended, trumped up. I had to buy one. Did you get one? Yeah, I bought a physical copy because I couldn't believe it. And it's real, right? Oh, it's real. Yeah, that's my understanding too, that it's real. Well, it could be. Let's have fun with this. Let's look from the remote viewing perspective. You know, by no means was remote viewing, the basic concept of it, non-existent before the SRI guys did it for the, the now famous Army operation. Remote viewing and its concept has been going on since humans began, I would say. Maybe these guys were able to remote view across time. I don't know. Or maybe... They understood something about the mathematics of reality, the fabric of reality, and how certain numbers are indicators of destinies and fates, okay? And maybe they understood how to put the pins, so to speak, in the fabric of reality to cause the ripples down the line. Now, I yeah. understand we're getting you know, some very esoteric things here, but maybe they understood how to manipulate that. Now, there is this concept, I was introduced to it by Seshery, and forgive me, I can't remember the name of the guy who originated it, that he got it from, but there's this concept of the, let me see if I can get this right, yeah, the axis of circumstance and the vector of desire, okay? Now, Seshery's interpretation that we have discussed at great length mm -hmm. is that you have this axis of circumstances or all the lines of the factors of your personal life that are out of your control, like who your parents are, like, you know, when you were a kid where they had you live and things like that, right? And the things in the greater world out there that you don't control. Those are the circumstances with which in your life you have to deal with. The vector of desire is the degree to which your will affects your life within the context of those circumstances. Now, maybe somebody in Trump's family past understood something about that vector of desire and how it could affect or alter or set that axis of circumstances for someone down their line, 
Okay, now we're getting into weird stuff because, quite frankly, the existence of that book is damn weird. Okay, <laughs> it is. So it demands that we get weird and get way outside the box on that speculative limb. What do I think is going on? I'm not quite sure, but I am certain something's going on there. Right. Something's going on there. And I think that it involves the true story of the 20th century, the true great mystery of our times. You know, all these people say, you know, oh, UFO is the greatest mystery of our time. Please give me a break. The mystery of the UFO is a subset of something bigger. Right. Okay. It's a footnote. The UFO is not the big deal, folks. Valet said that. That's not original with me. That UFOs, I think he said that UFOs are a subset of something larger. The whole extraterrestrial thing, that's just a subset, folks. That's not the end all be all answer to what we're talking about here. We're talking about something's been going on specifically for the last 120, 150 years. Something's been going on that you can catch glimpses of when you really look close at the fabric of reality and it's elusive hmm. and and it just hasn't really it's elusive for a reason and that's because of the, i think the way things work and somebody has figured out how to manipulate it and as i argue usually when i'm being critical of you know cory good and wilcock and all these alleged whistleblowers look i argue if you figured out how to travel through time or influence time or whatever. I argue that you're likely going to consider not blabbing it, not going on a damn radio show like whatever. <laughs> not this one, of course. <laughs> and saying, I am a time traveler. I, I mean, that's why I raised the BS flag on those guys. First of all, if it were true, they would have been silenced before they got to that point where they would have been silenced after the very first time they ran their mouths like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I don't care what they say or what their advocates use to argue. My point is somebody for the last hundred years or so has really figured out how to send ripples down the line through time and space, and they've been messing with that. And it's a deep, deep secret. Yeah, man, I agree for sure. And I wanted to get back to your work specifically too, but the last thing I wanted to say about this is that the writer of Back to the Future has also clearly stated that Biff Tannen is based on Donald Trump, and it's probably the most famous time travel movie in history or most famous time travel series in history. And that's a pretty interesting coincidence, too, when you think about it. OK, my question, and I understand the whole thing about Biff and how what he becomes in the, the second one. My favorite one of those is the third one, by the way. Oh, gee, it's in the Old West. And it retrospectively kind of feels like the whole Sonora Aero Club era, right? But yeah. anyway, was the writer of that saying this before the, the whole Trump became president era, or has this been something he said after that? I do think it's something that he said, I mean, maybe slightly before the okay. election time, but I think there's some similarities if you look at their hairstyles, for sure. If you look at the fact sure, that sure. Biff was a casino guy, right, in the movie? He has like a big... Trump like casino. Well, that, that's why I'm curious because if he, this what he's saying predates Trump becoming president, then that does indeed make that whole development of those three films all the more interesting. Right. He could be trying to capitalize, you know, just on a popular cultural motif. You know, you yeah. can't rule that out for sure. Right. But when you add those elements of the hairstyle, the attitude in general, the fact that he has the casinos, and the fact that he has that painting of himself. Yeah. Uh, above his desk. That's a very Trump type of thing. So yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to give it to him, I think. Well, I'm going to be having, a, it's interesting. Hanging in the hall in my mom's house are photo portraits of my sisters and, and I, okay. When I had mine done, I had it put on a larger, it's the largest picture of all of them in her hall. It's mounted on, you know, like a, uh, oh, not a picture frame, but when you get your pictures, I'm sorry, I, it's my 53-year-old mind, I guess. Anyway, you know, I did it as a goof, and it's placed. I What I did was when I hung it in the hall, it hangs higher than all the other photos, right? <laughs> That's what mm -hmm. you get with the only boy in the family named Walter, of all things. And I'm going to be having another large kind of portrait size <laughs> done from my official book cover author photo done 
And I do these things kind of halfway, you know, really as a goof. I even was joking with my sister, there's a place online where you can get a bust made of yourself. Oh, right. Oh, that's going to be the Christmas present for everybody. in. The oh, family. yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, man, I totally get you. I did the same thing in high school. I got my mom a cardboard cutout of myself, and I got my dad a tie with uh, my picture <laughs> all over it. So there you go. I get the appeal. Um, yeah, I, I think that's part of it. It's that boyish man. And, you know, when you're talking about a guy like Trump, you know, look, what, look I know they say, oh, he's done all these bankruptcies. Well, let me tell you something. He's made a hell of a lot more money than I ever had or probably ever will, you know. So right. you got to let roosters crow a little bit. It's funny how, and again, not in a political discussion, but it's funny how when it's your own rooster, you let them crow and sing all day. When it's the other guy's rooster, you want him to shut the hell up, right? <laughs> you know. Fair enough. Both sides do this. Both sides do this. What's really going on, people, is political magic, okay? We're, we're being divided for a reason because they don't want us really coming together that is true i'll side with you on that for sure and uh, i definitely also agree with you about the use of healthy ego especially humor in regards to that too but i guess i would probably just say uh for my own clarity that i probably split with you in thinking that you know trump's motivations for his ego inflation are the same as mine were in that day or what i would consider to be something that's healthy but that's just my opinion i definitely agree with you also that they are working to divide us and that's probably the bigger issue yeah. but i also wanted to switch gears a little bit and get into some other interesting things that you've been talking about i know a lot of the inside information you have seems to come from disclosures you got from your father and a mentor that you had when you were working for military intelligence and since we last talked you wrote a book called shimmering light lost in an mk ultra house of anu which talks about a situation where your father was involved in a crashed UFO retrieval in 1958. If I have this right, mm -hmm. he seems to have the impression that the pilots weren't alien, but a branch of humans that broke off from humanity in ancient times and colonized underground, which seems to vibe with a lot of the things we've been talking about. Can you tell us a little more about the story there and how it ties into maybe the larger saga? Sure. To better define actually what's in there, because it can get confusing, okay? He encountered under the ground humans that had gone underground during a surface cataclysm across the planet. It is my understanding, and I hope the book conveys this upon reading, that the group that was the civilization that was allegedly flying the thing that crashed at Roswell that was specifically a different group than the humans he encountered that had gone underground. They were, yes, really based underground, this group flying the machine, but they were a group of humans of another civilization from another place. Hmm. And that's how I get into discussing the Tue de Danan because they may have been, the group flying the device may specifically have been a group of humans from some other place off this planet, outside our world, that came here in ancient times and have stayed here and influenced human civilization while kind of remaining separate from us. Or I should say, and I get into this in the new book, they helped develop us for a while, but then they withdrew and became very selective with their encounters with us this is all the, the theory and speculation. And this matches the lore of this group called the Tue de Danan. I have started, and I go into this in the book. I'm not going to try to go into it here or even put it in a thumbnail. But I have started referring to them as the Tue Danu. And I explain why in the book to show the distinction between the original group we're talking about and their human client tribes or cultures or nations that they backed up, okay, and that actually are the ones mostly discussed in the Celtic lore and histories of what was going on in, you know, prehistoric Europe and on and so forth. It is the group that came from the other world that I call the Tue Danu that is in the context of who I think and exactly what my dad was describing. Mm. Did I confuse the issue more? 
<laughs> no, no, no. Because that Celtic lore is exactly what I was going to ask you about is its connection there. Because in one of your YouTube videos, you described the similarities between these quote unquote alien beings that people experience and fairy lore. And actually some of the technology described in that lore matches the kind of shape-shifting cloaking technology that's talked about in these experiences. And I am not the first to go there. Really the first guy to go there that I was introduced to this concept by was Jacques Vallée. Yeah. You know, he was famous as a UFO investigator through the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and into the 90s. And he really began to see this similarity. And the more he dug into it, the more he found this group, specifically the, the Tuatanu, Tuatanan, <laughs> take your pick, it's the Tue, essentially is the same root that's in there. And what's interesting is, and I'm not the only guy to notice this, really after he reached a point where he began to see this similarity between these alleged extraterrestrials and the Tue, and the fairy lore and all that, he really, really kind of backed off of writing about UFOs and doing so much of that. And I think that's significant. And I'm not the only one who's noticed this. And my understanding from people I know who have had very recent, you know, private conversations with him, he still holds that basic position. Now, that's not to say that either he nor I deny the possibility or the existence of extraterrestrials. Yes, of course, I think they exist. Yes, of course, he thinks they exist. Yes, of course, they are responsible for a certain percentage of UFOs, so to speak. But it cannot be discounted the cases and the encounters which really reflect more of this Tway group. Now, that said, I go into this in my book, the original roots of this Tway are off this planet, off our let's say, off our reality, because they're either from another planet or another dimension. Oh, boy, I said it. <laughs> and yes, there are things that I've come across in my research and other things that make me speak of this confidently that I know I don't go into publicly, I won't write about. Part of that is because there are things that I cannot offer any documentary evidence or, or enough that I feel it justifies, you know, putting it, you know, I don't want people, I, I'm not going to ask people for money to buy a book just full of pure, take my word for it, speculation. Okay. Right. I try in my books and my talks to present the things that I can point to either documents or a known proven historical context to back it up. Right. But in the realm of those things I don't talk about and won't talk about, are the things that convince me of the direction I'm going with this mysterious Tway, hmm. Denu. Well, I am intrigued, man. I really do think you do great work. I know there will be comments that say there is no such thing as an ex-military intelligence guy. <laughs> and You know what? All those guys, I hope you're listening right now, okay? You know what? I wish, because I'd be getting a paycheck, mm -hmm. okay? If you were to my house right now, I need cabinets in the kitchen. Some of my drawers are missing their faces. You know, I just, my, my tiling, I, I just, you know, my, I live in a house that's falling apart and I don't have the money to fix it up. You know, if I were that, okay, I wouldn't be, you know, my, my life would be a lot different. Fair. Okay. So here's why I laugh at them. They're ignorant. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Okay. And because I know that I'm not you know, this disinfo agent. And of course they'll say, well, yeah, he's going to say that. But, you know, they've gone so far down the paranoia stream that they need to check themselves. Right. But what can we do? Again, that's part of that crossing the Rubicon. They're going to say what they're going to say. And maybe what I put out there isn't important for them to consider. You know, I have to consider that too. It just may not be anything they need. Yeah. Well, I understand their perspective overall just because – People, you know, the community has been burned in the past, but I've always thought of you specifically as honest about your background, honest about what's been disclosed to you versus what's speculation. And when your body of work is compared to the Andy Basagio epic tales of jump rooms to Mars or Corey Goods wild stories, it seems way more plausible. And the dots seem to have some logic to their connections. And it's based on more than just personal testimony. So I appreciate it. And I put you in a different category. 
than a lot of that other stuff. Thank you. I hope that it would be, you know, my background and my honesty about it that does help with my credibility because I'm one of those guys with that background, you know, who really does have the background that I claim, but who is not out there trying to sell, you know, a line of horse crap just to make a buck. You know, there's things I could be doing that would be making me a lot more money. I just found out recently that some of these guys get paid when they do these podcasts, Greg. I'm not getting paid. To do any of them. Yeah, what am I doing be a, wrong? <laughs> a podcast guest union? We got to shut that down right now. <laughs> it's like, what the heck? What, what do you mean? Yeah, the, a particular researcher said, you know, my agent makes me charge X number of dollars. I'm like, what the? Wait a minute. What's going on? There's what I'm doing wrong. Well, I will say that the only time that's ever come up in the years of I've been doing this is uh, the liaisons for Stephen Greer asked what the compensation would be. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I look at doing these things as this is promotion. You know, I get, yeah, it's a win-win. Yeah. I get to tell people where to buy my books if they choose to. Yeah. It, I, you know, I finally reluctantly put a donate button on my empire of the wheel blog spot just because, you know, well, everybody else is doing it and yeah, I am flat broke and it would help. But you've never heard me. This is the first time I think I've mentioned it on your show ever that I have a donate button. I don't push the hell out of it. I think I just recently tweeted it. (laughs) Well, everyone should get supported for their work. And I don't think that we should segregate the conspiracy community and say, oh, well, if you're making money off work in this realm only, then it's bullshit. But yet every other realm of life, people are supposed to do what they're good at and what they're and what they enjoy right and nowhere else does it have any merit on their authenticity right and i think that's a a serious issue for us right i remembered my point my the point i was getting to is i do these podcasts because i look at it as promotions even when i speak at events if i make any money from that event you know they pay for i tell them you need to pay for my transportation and my lodging and give me some space to sell some books that's where if i make anything It's putting my books on a table. I'm not paid to actually speak at something. I haven't been, that I recall. Or if I was, it was like, you know, nominal. In fact, I think I did one TV appearance where I just discovered that I forgot to mail in, you know, the tax info thing they need to, I guess, pay you. So I I haven't even pursued what it is, you know, the nominal fee I was supposed to get on that. That shows you, do I want to make money? Yeah. But, you know, my perspective has been, well, people who are interested in my stuff will hopefully buy my books. And that's how I make my money. I don't think of these, hmm, every time I open my mouth or deign to appear, you know, before the masses that I'll get paid. I mean, I consider it, I'm lucky that you're asking me to do this, or that anybody who asks me to do their show, it's like, oh, cool, you know, to ask them to pay me in this thing, I, I don't know, I just... And I feel very lucky to have great guests, too. I mean, there's some excellent, excellent research being done out there, and the fact that they'll come on and spend a couple hours with me is very humbling, too, but... It is a win-win, the media game we play. And it is fun to think about the fact that we're addressing a crowd larger than the capacity of Madison Square Garden several times over, and we don't even have to leave the house. (laughs) And (laughs) that said, man, big thanks. Keep doing what you do. I'm really looking forward to that new book coming out, and I'm sure we can talk about more stuff and more details when it does. And until then, keep it up. All righty. Thank you, Greg, for having me on, and I look forward to talking with you again. You got him, man. Have a good one. All right, you too. And boom goes the dynamite, good people of the internet. Boom, indeed. Walter Bosley, he's the goddamn man. And I don't know if he's critical enough of Trump for half of you out there, but when hating a guy like Trump is so fashionable, you kind of got to respect a contrarian. I don't have a whole lot of nice things to say about any president, but it is just funny when I know I'm going to see comments like, oh, I had to shut this off when the guests started justifying Trump's behavior, as if you couldn't possibly get past something like that to actually hear the super unique and interesting things that the guest does have to say. It's like, how do you deal with your grandparents or your gun-loving uncle? Don't we all spend time with friends and family that have views on politics or philosophy or religion that's different than us? Does anyone actually just do a 180 and walk the other way? We shouldn't be so rigid. 
that's the only reason I'm kind of on this thing again. Many of us are pretty on edge right now and caught up in a particular identity or worldview. And I'm just trying to bring everybody to the table and say, look, I don't care what each of us thinks about Trump as a man or as a president. I just think it's fucking amazingly weird that his name is on these Charles Delshaw drawings. I think it's fucking fascinating that his uncle had the career that he had. Let's just hold hands around the digital campfire and take in those incredible facts and what they could mean. I don't care that Walter is a bit more pro-military in his outlook. I mean, that's his world. He grew up in that stuff, worked in that stuff. And that's the reason he has a lot of the insights that he actually gets to share with us. Me? I'm a weak nerd who's held a gun three times in his life. So, funny how it works out, right? Clearly, our experiences shape us a whole lot, and it doesn't make one person right and one wrong, necessarily. Regardless, I did like Walter's explanation of how he sees the shadow government operating and that every candidate has its own small M mafia backing them, and you can have agents and double agents in the same groups, because these operations and this espionage and these plants, they aren't new, so their strings are more and more tangled as time goes on. That's how I see things, too, to a large degree. But I'm glad we got to do this. I finally got to talk to someone at length about the weirdness that is Baron Trump's journey to the inner Earth and all this Tesla stuff. And that's another trigger that's going to set off some Flat Earth fans. How can Tesla build a craft to Mars in 1903 when space isn't real? Well, we don't know what's real and what isn't unless we're talking about the moon landing footage. But it has been all the CGI and fake stuff from NASA that sent me down the rabbit hole more than anything else. And I think the more likely interpretation of that fuckery is that we have shadowy groups that are much further along than they want us to believe. And I'll cite Gary McKinnon getting into the Pentagon computers and seeing lists of military astronauts stationed on space platforms more than a decade ago. And there are many little conspiracy sagas like Gary McKinnon's, and I don't think those are the psyops. I think those are the small tears in the veil of secrecy. So maybe this narrative is possible. I definitely like it. And let's give Walter some props for all the aspects of subterranean life and lost cities that enters into his work and his anecdotes. As this was going on, I was thinking, well, goddamn, Walter and me have a lot more of a synergy when it comes to the aspects of the alternative world that we like to see most. I mean, even go back to the first show I ever did with Walter about his book Latitude 33, The Arcane Science and Hermetic Engineering of the Happiest Place on Earth. That is a great topic, right? Ley lines and natural magic where Disneyland is placed. And his secret mission series is right up my alley too. So I think Walter deserves more credit and attention than he gets, which makes me happy to have him back on the higher side and also on the subject of his books. He did want me to mention that he pulled... Most of his books from Amazon. You know, we all fight our battles against the various overbearing titans of industry. And now he sells his books on lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U dot com. And then you can search Walter Bosley and find his whole repertoire. But let him know you like this show. Throw him some love. It's hard out here for a pimp. We all want to feel appreciated once in a while. And speaking of appreciation, big thanks to everyone who participated in my Reddit AMA. 95% positive comments and questions, so I can't complain. Over 100 cues were aid. And another bit of news. People who have been hoping, wishing, and praying for a Higher Side live event, you need pray no more. It's happening. The Higher Side Chats with Greg Carlwood and the Tinfoil Hat with Sam Tripoli are doing a joint podcast live in front of an audience at the Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena. I am really psyched. I am really nervous. You don't want to throw a party that nobody shows up for. And I got a bit of my reputation out there on the line. And these comics are hoping I can actually put asses in seats and people actually might want to see me. It's only 10 bucks. It's on October 10th at the Ice House in Pasadena. Please, please, please come if you can. I think there are tickets still available. I did have a couple dozen people tell me they were going to come just from the social media posts, but... You can trust about 10% of that, usually. I don't know how we're going to do the guests. I think Sam says we have Eddie Bravo for all the Rogan fans out there. I've never met Eddie, but I'm kind of psyched to. So that's my deal. Sign up for Plus if you want to get twice as much higher side. Today with Walter, we got into the underground chamber found below Carlsbad Caverns and the remnants of an ancient civilization. We talked about the story of his father and the humans he encountered that had gone underground. 
what Walter's military mentor told him was found in Antarctica in the 1950s. That's pretty amazing. Also, David Wilcock and Corey Good, for people who know those names. And then we talked about other stories from the subterranean realms. All good stuff. Classic higher side stuff. I hope you join the club, thehiresidechatsplus.com. I also posted a really interesting newspaper article I found from Tesla's day about one of his discoveries or inventions that I'd never heard of. It's an eternal youth chair where he's quoted in describing how everyone will look forever young when they get zapped by his electrical current. It's really interesting, kind of relates to what we talked about today, but you can see the article on the Plus forums. And before I really get out of here, there is one more thing. I was watching Roger Stone's press conference today, and if you haven't watched the Netflix doc, Get Me Roger Stone, wow, you should. Talk about a guy who has some serious influence behind the curtain. But he was talking to the media today about the whole Russian collusion thing, and he made one pretty interesting remark. And and did you have any other communication with Whisper 2 beyond? None whatsoever, and I had made that public yesterday. We released the entire exchange, which takes place, I believe, between August 15th and September 9th, many weeks after the publication by WikiLeaks of the uh, DNC material, meaning collusion with Guccifer in the hacking and release of that material would be impossible unless I owned a time machine, which I do not. Yeah, you might not, Roger, but you just might know someone who does. Well, that's it for me, folks. Your move, time-traveling Trumps, Nimza Nazis, and the secret order of the Martian colony. Your fucking move. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes And then realized it was dark outside It was a light coming down from the sky I don't know who or why Must be those strangers that come every night whose saucer shaped light put people up tight Leave blue green footprints that glow in the dark I hope they get home all right Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please take me along I won't do anything wrong Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please This morning I was feeling quite weird I had flies in my beard My toothpaste was smeared I opened my window They'd written my name Said, so long, we'll see Ha 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 ha.